our Renchi Poetry Reading today, a very special event with some very special people here today. Um, and so we have a bunch of poets who are here, and they are going to... <laughs> <laughs> My friend Reagan is co-hosting with us today. Uh, we are going to get to them in just a moment, but I wanted to thank everyone for showing up today and um, supporting the Watershed Journal and all we do here. And uh, there's um, a lot going on right now with Watershed. So uh, I'll just say that one of the biggest things that we want to brag about right now is our submission window is open for the spring edition of the Watershed Journal. And it will be open until March 8th. So if you have some poetry, prose, essays, photography, original artwork that you would like to submit, uh, please submit to the Watershed Journal at gmail.com. Perhaps today's reading will inspire you to write something. We hope it does. And uh, that will be the way to make sure that your work is published and included in our literary magazine. Uh, so without any further ado, um, today's event is going to uh, include a group of writers who have been doing collaborative poetry for, um, I think, going on two years now. And uh, so in order to introduce what the group is all about, what they've been doing, and how it's been working, uh, we're going to bring the group coordinator, Wayne Swanger, uh, to talk and briefly introduce the group. And um, then we'll uh, talk more about the, um, the method that the, that the poets use and then um, get into the reading for today. Wayne, are you there with me? I'm here. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, your diligence in coordinating the event and uh, wrangling all of these talented poets to um, be able to perform their poetry today. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> so I'll let you talk a little bit about the group and then I think we have Patricia Threshart who's going to go over more of the specifics and, and what the listeners can expect as they read or listen to the readings. Um, but yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, um, you used the word coordinator? I did. Oh, that's that's way <laughs> off base. It's more kingpin? like... Is that a better poetry kingpin? No, no. Uh, border collie. Yeah, oh, I see. <laughs> Trying to... Uh, it's a wonderful group um, <laughs> that are uh, involved with this, this Renshi group. And we have a number of groups in there. But uh, so today... I don't even know what we call ourselves. I've been referring to ourselves as, as Renshi poets, but uh, that original name really belongs to another group uh, in Hawaii. So uh, maybe we're lowercase poets and they're the uppercase poets. But um, well, th today, just in terms of um, the order of, of events, uh, I'll introduce everyone. I don't know if everyone is on as yet, but I'll go through this outline quickly for you, and then I'll introduce um, the the readers today. We'll go over the history of our regional group and groups. We'll look at the rules and process. Uh, Patricia Threshart will do that. We'll read through one cycle of poems uh, that we put together three years ago. We're in our third year now of this group. We'll have some question and answer time from the audience that can ask questions of any of us uh, regarding the process or uh, the benefits or the problems we might have had or you know whatever you're curious about. And we'll have an opportunity for anyone else who wants to join in a Renshi exercise um, following the presentation. I'll give you some contact information and you'll be able to, to sign up, so to speak, for a trial run just to uh, see what it's like. And then we'll have a, a second reading of uh, the first cycle of this year's poems from each of the poets. Okay, so let me introduce our uh, Renshi poets in the Pennsylvania wilds. Um, Byron Hoot, is Byron here? Not yet. He is on his way. Oh, okay. Well, he likes to make an entrance. Uh, I'm aware of that, yes. <laughs> uh, Sonia Hunt. Sonia is here. I believe I saw her name. Yes, a second ago, yeah. Are you going to uh, 
Do you want each person to come up and say something before the beginning or? Well, you know, if you can, if they have their cameras on, if they can wave and they, we can put a face with the name, that would be. I think we'll just. too much trouble, we'll skip yeah, that. Yeah, we'll do that during the readings. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So Byron Hoot, Sonia Hunt, Deborah Sarbin, uh, Wayne Swanger, me, Philip Terman, Joanne Threshart, and Gerard Tornasol are the poets uh, that will be reading today and are a part of this Renshi group. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of our, our local group. And then uh, Patricia will talk about the process and the rules that we use in, uh, to govern our, our interactions or collaboration. But about six years ago, um, my wife and I were in Hawaii visiting family, and we were at the Ailani Palace in Honolulu in the, the gift shop and bookstore. And I asked my sister-in-law, who is native Hawaiian, uh, if she could suggest a couple of books that would give Hawaiian perspective. And she recommended a number of history books. And she recommended this book called No Choice But to Follow. And this book has, and I don't want to, I'm not overstating it, has been life-changing for me. Uh, it's resulted in these Renshi groups and actually has resulted in uh, a book publication uh, as a result of it. But, but No Choice But to Follow is written by four Hawaiian women who used a writing process called Renshi. And the simplest explanation, and, and Patricia will go through this in a little more detail, is basically they agreed for the year to to write poetry, you know, poems, and they would be using the last line of the previously submitted poem as the title or the first line of their poem. So, in essence, all the poems and all the poets are tied together through that year activity. Well, when I read the introduction, what I was really anticipating when I read the book was that I thought, well, it would just be a bunch of echoes. So someone will talk about porcupines and someone else will have to write about porcupines and then we will have a whole bunch of animal kind of poems. And that wasn't the case. Uh, and I also thought, well, maybe if it's not that, it'll end up being one long epic poem, a narrative where everyone's tying together and trying to put together a story. And it wasn't that either. In fact, it was a delightful surprise of, of poems that, that were delightful, original, and refreshly expressive. I mean, just a variety. It was a wonderful read. And as I read it, I thought, wow, this is, this is fascinating. This is, is beautiful how you can take someone else's wor words and you can take that and use it to generate and express your own voice and write your own poem. So I thought, thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, that would be fun to try and see if I could get a, a number of other people willing to do it. And I kind of hesitated because I thought, boy, I don't know if I'm good enough. I mean, how embarrassing would it be to get a group of people together and then be the clunker in the group? And so there, there was that fear. And I thought, well, and another fear was, um, am I going to embarrass myself? Uh, can I be that disciplined to write on demand? <laughs> Can I take someone else's words and generate a poem from it? I mean, I had all kinds of excuses not to do it. But then I started thinking of the benefits, and I thought, well, it, it will instill a little discipline in me. It will force me to write a poem at least a couple of times a year, where before I would just write when, you know, the urge hit me. Um and I also thought it'd be a good way to see styles of other poets, uh, maybe some other forms. I mean, I didn't know. I thought this might be a good way to be exposed to a, a range of of poetry. And 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 lastly, I think selfishly, the main reason was I thought, well, you know, if I write and and, and kind of encouraged or forced to write six poems through the year or whatever number it would turn out to be, if I had one keeper in all those poems, it would have been worth it. 
And so I contacted a number of friends and we started the first Frenchie group six years ago, a rather diverse group um, that continues to this day. They're not um, all the same original poets. We've had some deaths and some other unexpected um, reasons for departures, but we've kept that group going. And um, that group actually, the first year I put, we put together the compilation of poems and we called our, we call ourselves the Renshi Friends. And this first book is the compilation of our first year's effort. So anyway, we, we've, we've started a group here. There are uh, two other regional groups that I'm involved with. One, this group here, um, well, the original, the this, this six-year group, this group that's reading today is we're in our third year. And then there's a new group that just started this year that's in the region. And then there's another group which was organized and is managed. Uh, the border collie for that group is um, Gerard Tornasol. And uh, I haven't asked him how he's making out, but I, I know they've completed, uh, I, th I think, one one cycle. So let's, uh, let's see. I want to make certain that I don't miss anything here. Let's, let's let, uh, Patricia describe the rules and the process that we use in to have generated this cycle of poems that we're going to share with you. Patricia. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Wayne. Uh, also, thank you, uh, Sarah and Jess, for having us. It's a, it's a great opportunity for those of us, us who have been writing in this collaborative way to share our work and, and hopefully uh, encourage many of you listening uh, to think about uh, starting a group like this that I know Wayne is going to uh, talk more about. So poets don't usually like rules, except when it comes to form, meter, <laughs> and rhyme. Um, but we, we abide by a certain set of rules. As Wayne said, the commitment has been uh, a, for a calendar year. And um, as he said, the, the way the po poetry works is uh, each poet takes up where the last one left off using the last line of the previous poem, either as a title or as a beginning line. And, you know, you're, we allow some latitude there. It may be a phrase from the last line. It may be the last two lines, but the spirit is there. The idea is to have these poems weave together, um, you know, from uh, using the prior, um, using the prior um, poem at last line. Um, our poems are due the Monday after, you know, a week after the, the month on a Monday every week. And sometimes poets need to take a little longer. We've waited two weeks, but with that cycle, uh, we write about six to eight poems a year as, as Wayne was saying. Um, and, uh, you know, we send our poems into the whole group, and that's an exciting moment, to be honest. You send your poem to the whole group with an, in an attachment that helps with that compilation at the end of the year. And it's really an exciting moment to send it so that people can see how you took that prompt um, and, and expressed your, um, your poetic voice, your poetic, um, your poetic approach. And it's really been a fun exploration. Um, at the end of last year, I think it was, and maybe even the year before, we did one other thing. Everyone got a chance to do an echo round. I think this was Gerard's uh, ex idea. We did an echo round where each of us wrote a poem using a line we really wish we had, <laughs> but didn't get to use because it wasn't the poem before ours. And that was a lot of fun as well. So really, that's the heart of it. Uh, committing for a year, committing to write when it's your turn, committing to take that last line, that last phrase, and use it to to um, uh, spark a new poem, and committing to do that in a timely manner. And I will tell you, um, I have certainly written poems 
that I never would have written otherwise and explored ideas and concepts that I really necessarily wouldn't have uh, come upon myself. So uh, it's really been a wonderful experience. So that's, that's what I thought I'd share, Wayne. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going. Is Byron in? Does anyone know has Byron arrived? Coming, coming, coming. We're coming. Sorry, uh, we are having. Uh, we got customers in the bookstore, which is great. Uh, so Byron is here. Good. And he's sitting with us. So I'm going to put the camera. Wait a second. Oh, he wants to wait just a second. Um, Reagan wants to say hello to everybody. Not certainly, this right. Reagan. I don't know. So, so I can go through some <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wayne. Yes. Am, am I starting side by side, or do I have the wrong collection? I'm sorry. I'm am I starting with the poem side by side? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. All right. Well, wait. You don't go yet. I just okay. wanted to. I wanted to make certain you were here. That's all. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's oh. what I thought. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I don't answer that question, and I plead the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, let me introduce our, uh, our first reading here. Um, these poems were written, um, we, we decided we were going to write, you know, read two cycles, uh, share that today. And so this first cycle is the first cycle that we, and a cycle is, all of the poets writing um, their turn. So uh, the first cycle would be everyone taking their turn, and then the second cycle is the next round where we've started all over again. So this is the first year, and this is the first cycle of that first year. And I'll just quickly read the order to prep everyone, you know, all the, the poets, and then... Uh, just introduce yourself in the name of your poem when you, when you read, okay? Um, Wayne Swanger, I'll start, and then Patricia Thrushart, Philip Turman will be next, Sonia Hunt, Gerard Tornasol, um, Deborah Sarbin, and then Byron Hoot, okay? So there may be a little pause, I guess, but, but between the time you can toggle between each of us, but please note that... Uh, you know, we're using the last line of the poem just read will be used as either the title, the portion of it will be either the title or the first line of the, the following poem that's read. Okay? May I start, uh, Sarah? Yeah, there you go. You're all good. Okay. This first poem um, is The Vigil. Amazing how quiet the great Pyrenees can be when death approaches. Her lumbering tread imperceptible, but for the barely audible sound of untrimmed nails on wooden floor. She moves sparingly, instinctively to find a vantage point. When satisfied, she heaves a heavy sigh as she heaps herself into a white mound of fur and faithfulness. This steadfast sentinel holds vigil by a bedside. Listening this night, the great Pyrenees hears, but is not stirred by the clock's constant cadence. Calibration of a life passing. She does not stir when the clarion of bleeding ewes arises from the barn below. Nor does she stir when he stirs, his breathing labored, rhythmic, marked by staccato exclamations as he struggles to reach the finish. Amazing how loud a great Pyrenees can be when breathing ceases and death departed. A doleful bark thunderous echoes through the house, awakening everyone but the dead. Patricia. So my poem is called The Awakening. 
Awakening everyone but the dead of night's companions. Those thick trunks of oak and maple, of cherry and fir, barely visible in the moonless gloom, who sleep the sleep of the long living, for whom a year is a day and a day is a minute. They do not stir as the coyote sings to defend its kill, as the owl rasps its vicious victory over the vole, as the vixen screams her battle with scarcity. But we are roused, abruptly, our primal hairs raised, our ancient muscles perking our ears like the dog who listens intently, then howls back, transformed in a moment to a wolf. We awaken in thrall to our basest instincts, to fight back with knuckle or rock, or flee on limbs meant to run great grassy distances beyond the reach of death. So following me in this cycle is Philip Terman. Wow. How you doing, everybody? <laughs> How do I see myself here? Oh. Okay, I got it. All right. Um, this is called One of the Immortals. Beyond the reach of death, those rare spirits, so long alive and hardy, they build ponds and trap and plant every spring hundreds of trees to make certain the land will renew beyond them, whose bodies seem ageless, as if they somehow discovered the fountain of youth in their secret souls, who rise early and quickly eat and quickly get into their truck and set off to check their traps and clear brush and mow, barely breaking for lunch. So devoted they are to their task, impervious to distraction, forget the dark, until their labor is done and their rest is deep. Such a man was Sheryl, one of the ageless ones, one of the ones you'd shake your head at and say, he'll live forever. He does, like each of God's patriarchs, leaving his heart-earned legacy, committed to maintaining his family and his property onto the next generation, trapper and planter, father of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, countless and therefore blessed as the stars. Uh, and then the next person is uh, <laughs> Sonia Hunt. <laughs> Come on up, Sonia. <laughs> All right. So it looks like Sonia has joined us from a device that, um, from a cell phone device, so we're not able to um, uh, I'm not able to invite her onto the stage. Um, so Sonia, if you're able to join us from a laptop or desktop computer, then we'll be able to do that. Um, in the meantime, um, Wayne, let me just find you here. Let me bring you on with us real quick. Okay, do you want me to read Sonia's? Yeah, I was going to see um, if uh, if you would want to go ahead and read Sonia's for her. And Sonia, my apologies. I'd love to hear it from your own voice. Um, but to keep the the thing rolling, uh, Wayne, would you mind uh, doing honor? Yes, I'll do my best, Sonia. This is a wonderful poem, and I probably even mispronounced the uh, title, but I'll do my best. Stock Pallad. Blessed as the stars, the obliging moon illumines the path we stride in jaunty mood, foolhardy with a fine idea. Shifting shadows, shapes, boulder or a crouching bear, stricken tree or Monroe's ghost, we reach the lower slopes unharmed. Climbing now with wary feet, feeling for the pebbled path, Conscious of the dark immensity afar, the distant sheen of lock. Beyond the smudge of forest, the way seems clear, but still we veer into a weeping gully. 
baptism for the sheepskin gloves. Scrambling now in sodden boots, we squelch and curse and struggle free, speeding up to beat the cold, scurrying to beat the clock. With scratching limbs, we challenge ridges, rocks, and unseen gaps, weaving round sandstone pinnacles, conscious of the looming drop. Clinging round the mass, the bars, the last ascent, we reach the height of our ambition, facing east with pounding hearts. And here in a, is our epiphany as we absorb with awe of delight the humbling beauty of the rising sun from the ragged summit of Stock Palad. Gerard Tornasol is next. Thank you, Wayne. And we're going to bring on Gerard next. And there he is. Yeah, I don't know how to share my camera. There should be a red button. Uh, that has a camera, but there you go. Thank you, uh, Wayne, for reading for Sonia, and thank you, Sonia, for the beautiful poem. Uh, the correct pronunciation is Stack Polly. Echo of Stack Polly. From the ragged summit of Stack Polly, down to the point of invisibility. I wish to lose myself here in this sacred place which has possessed me. Oh, I climbed here, huff puffing a human being like all the rest, making our way fast, past little bits of gums and cigarette ends, my heart pounding on the scramble, to find this, a place where wolves open the sky. Shall you not open your eyes? There's nothing that can prepare you for the everlasting Ken. To breathe like this, inhaling waters from below, like a fish yet to be swimming among the low clouds, blessed as the stars, yes, of course, yet a Highlander's measure more in the knowing that she owns me, in surrender to be nothing. I suppose like death's howl takes you, awakening everyone but the dead being you. Or perhaps, as the promise of the way suggests, this crag, I know, without hearing its word, is beyond the reach of death, for death cannot touch it. Maybe, as promised ourselves, doesn't touch us at last. Be it known, we are here together as friends. As heaven is known when you see it, Never wish to leave it for the heavy airs beneath. Cry like a baby to leave her arms. To waste away here at what's been brought to us. Having ascended, wish the whole earth to stay and to go on to nothing. Nothing. To be the echo. Thank you again, Sonia. Up next is Deborah Zarbin. Thank you. This is untitled. To be the echo to your narcissus, us reimagined and reworked as classical troubled couple. I would need time. I'm trying to imagine in all possible ways what I'd have to do. I'd have to diminish in the first place. Ace the art of disappearing, dissolve into mere sound, into muffled shoe shuffles down an empty corridor, or nonsense syllables pinging from strong slopes, loping and looping, meaning unmoored, 
unanchored half-life of a half-syllable. No, I won't. No, I won't. Instead, I'll keep roaring out for your response once, twice, waiting for our words to dance, chance a meeting of minds with no clear-cut leader, urge our loving words to companionably sit side by side on the couch. Byron, you're up next. Thanks, Jennifer. This is a soliloquy. Uh, side by side. Sit side by side on the couch is more like it. I don't know who thought that language of pearly gates, streets of gold, angels singing all day and night, hallelujah, off key, I might add, wouldn't get on one's last nerve. Angel singing, absurd. There are so many who need the help from whom they never see. I'll take the heat for the word paradise, but that's so old, so composed of squares and circling and circles enclosing, keeping in, keeping out. I never thought it would degenerate to what is heard. And that story about what happened in the first paradise, Lord, I've never seen such discord run after so hard. What I can say is that snake, that great serpent, doesn't know a thing about language and took advantage of Adam and Eve because of his authority of longevity. The tree of knowledge, the tree of life, were or are mine. That's true. What's also true is that Adam and Eve had their own trees to tend to. The problem was thinking they could get what wasn't theirs by taking mine. I've never known it not to be true. To take and claim what is not yours, which was, is the promise of the great serpent, a certain exile from all you are to be. And I didn't have to tell them that once they took a bite from the apple. Beginnings are so hard, endings too. Yes, sitting side by side on the couch waiting for words to dance. Ah, oh, how true. Oh, to make that dream reality. And I believe I may be up next since I started the next one. Uh, the next cycle? The next cycle. Okay, we're going to do a Q&A first. So, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for the first round, uh, Poets. That was beautiful. And uh, what we're going to do now is run a question and answer and allow participants tuning in to ask their questions. And so the way to do that would be to raise your hand and then we can bring you onto the screen. But um, since we have so many wonderful poets, the best way to be able to know who's talking and how to facilitate would be for you to address your question to one of uh, the poets specifically by name. So when you have a question, let us know who that question is for. We'll bring them up on screen so you can ask those questions to the person that you would like to. And it looks like we have um, some people raising their hands already, which is wonderful. So... Ray, Gerard, there you are. We can't hear you, though, because your mic is muted. Mm -hmm. Still no good. Yeah. <laughs> is there a red button with a yes. microphone next to your video camera? There should be an icon at the bottom that looks like a microphone. Bye. Okay, we'll come back to you, Ray, in just a minute. <laughs> we'll try it again. Yeah. We, we'll move on to our next uh, question, yeah. and then we'll get right back to you, Ray. Good. All right, Debbie Allen, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm so glad to see that you have a question for um, the group and someone specifically. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, I don't know who to ask my question to, but I'll say this. Everything was fantastic. Deborah's was one of my favorites, so I'm going to ask my question to her. 
wonderful. We'll bring her up. And I have th three questions. Okay. All right. Good. Is she ready? Yeah, she's yes. coming on. <laughs> Here we go. That was Thanks. beautiful. That was beautiful. Oh, thank you. They were all beautiful. Um, so my, my, my first question is, um, is there a lot of difference for you in how easily the poem comes? And is that related to the, the, line, the words you have? Or is it more just like, I'm not in the mood to write a poem this week or, you know? Mm -mm. No, it, it really does vary. Um, you know, some lines I can just take off with. With some poems, I've written three poems and nuked them all before I finally found the poem that I submitted to the group. You know, so yeah, it just depends. And, and I never know. I ha you know, sometimes I think, oh, I'll read, you know, my colleague's poem and think, what am I ever going to do with that? And as soon as I sit down with that, you know, I live with it. I, it, I have no problem. Um, and others, I might think, oh, that'll be easy to do and struggle. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's hard to predict. But, yeah, it does vary, I find. I'd love to hear, you know, what others have found, too. But yeah, I think it, that would be interesting. It, okay, it can be a second question is, um, are you influenced at all? I, I would love to hear these answers from everybody, actually. But are you influenced at all by that? The poem or the poems that came before, and and how in the form your poem takes, not what you say, but how you say it. Oh no, there I have to say, not at all. Okay. I I definitely don't feel any uh, compunction to follow through in a particular form. Uh, I just do whatever I you know the poem kind of the line makes the poem, and then the poem makes its form for me at least. Okay. And my last question is, um, do you think about the last line that you're writing? Do you think about that and, and that you are setting someone else up? Does that influence your writing of that last line? Uh, to some extent, yes. Because I, I do try to, I, and sometimes, the, again, the poem has to, you know, the integrity of the poem has to be there in that last line. So mm -hmm. there are times when I've just had to give someone a line that, well, I think you'll see it in the next example, though, is okay. I think that was a tough line for Patricia to pick up on. Uh, so you'll get to hear that in our next cycle. Okay. But, um, but I always try to end with an, you know, I try to give an image, at least. That's always my goal, is that someone will have an image that they could take and maybe take in different kinds of directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the questions, Deb. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for stepping up with questions. And I love to hear the interaction between um, participants and poets. And that's really, I think, one of the most rewarding things for the poets to be able to hear how people are receiving their work and what ideas it sparks. So um, I highly encourage anyone else who is participating and has been watching this first round of poems to raise your hand. You just click that little icon at the bottom, the little hand icon. And then you can come up to the stage and ask your question to a poet of your choice. And uh, it's um, kind of a cool thing. I know virtual meetings have their ups and downs, but it's kind of cool that you're able to pick someone out and then um, bring them up to, you know, kind of face to face like that. Other questions from the group? And uh, I do want to mention that um, after the event is over, after the readings are over, we'll leave the tables up in the lobby. Um, so, like Debbie, you said that some of the questions that you had, you'd love to hear from other poets. So I encourage everyone, if you have the time, to stay on after the meeting, join the tables and the chats, uh, and you can expand a little bit more hearing from different voices, uh, their answers to those questions. Uh, we can try to pull Gerard up again if yeah, think, um, his mic is working. Hopefully yeah, Brandy, if you had a question, go ahead and raise your hand again just to make sure. You may have had your hand raised from um, when I was bringing you on before. Maybe that was the confusion. Oh, okay. Who else has questions? Last call for this will be our only opportunity for Q and A. So if you have a question, now's the time. No, no question from Ray. Okay. 
Oh, here we have. All right. Oh, Debbie and Wayne. Debbie and Wayne. So we'll go with Wayne first. Here. I'd like to know what is the uh, the biggest benefit that uh, one of the Renshis has garnered from this activity, and what's the toughest thing? And whoever punches the response button first can answer it. But you know, I'm I'm curious as I do this, just you know, what what is really the, the best thing about this for you, and what is the the toughest thing to we're gonna put we're gonna put the spotlight on Byron because he said he doesn't know and that I take that as a challenge. <laughs> that's that's really nice. That's really nice. One of the things which I find intriguing is like Patricia said, you never know what poem you're gonna write. In some ways, it's easier to start from a, an established point than it is to start from nowhere. And I find the last line of the poem intriguing in what it does respond to in me. Because I never know what that's going to be. So I find that, that interesting. Uh, mostly the most challenging thing for me, which is challenge period, is getting the thing done on time. <laughs> it's not because I can't do it on time, I just forget about it. So uh so the most the most challenging is, is simply a time factor. But but you know, the the other thing which I, I enjoy about it is it is is an engagement in ways I would not otherwise engage. And I think that's pretty important, especially for writers to put themselves out in unknown, maybe somewhat uncomfortable situations and see what their response is. So, so I like it for that. Right. Good, well, thank you. That's a great question, Wayne. I think that's something I like to see uh, continue into the tables afterwards. Um, oh, and she even figured out how to make himself. I'm Wayne, so impressed wow. with Wayne. All right, Debbie, I'm bringing you on. Hi again. So I actually had two other questions, but I didn't want to hog it, so I didn't ask him. But these are for Wayne. They're okay. Um, let's bring him up. Perfect. And they're quick, I think. Um, no, that's uh, yeah. You're. This I'm is so great. glad that you have these questions because it's mm -hmm. I, a lot of times it sparks other conversation when somebody you know has an idea that they discuss. So there's. There's Wayne. Okay. Okay. Um, these are kind of logistics things. So, can you think? Do you think you can have too many people in a Renshi group? Yes. And what would kind of a limit type thing be? Well, when I've tried to organize these, I think six is really a pretty good number. Um, four, your your turn comes around so quickly sometimes. At, Individuals can get stressed out because there is a, a certain amount of pressure for that. I'm, I'm a two-weeker. I know that we're supposed to have it done in a week, but I've, I've never, you know, two weeks is to me is the ultimate deadline, and, and I always take the extra time. But so there is a little pressure there. So four is minimal, and that's what the original Renshi poets, the Hawaiian group, did. But that, to me, that just comes around too quickly. And once you hit like seven, then there's too much of a lag and people tend to lose focus. And then when their turn comes up, they don't even know it. And then that's where the border collie comes in and you've got to go and say, hey, it's your turn. You know, two, three weeks later when you realize they don't know it's their turn. So yeah. you know, five and six are, are pretty good numbers. Okay, and then my other question is, you, you mentioned three groups that you've wrangled. Do you find, like, differences? Like, each group kind of has its own personality or the bodies of work turn out differently than if, you know, if you mixed up some of the group members? I mean, I don't know if that makes sense. Well, no, I, th I think definitely there, there's group 
character. I mean, um, each of the groups is different, and and part of it is the composition of the groups um, are different in some ways by choice. You know, as uh, organized groups, you know, the first group is very diverse. We had a, uh, a Ugandan poet, published poet. We had a Oneida, a Native American, published poet. We had a Hawaiian published poet, you know, and that was quite a diverse group, you know, ethnically and, and racially. And that was, that was amazing, except it was tough to follow the lines sometimes <laughs> because of the, the syntax and language differences. Yeah. Uh, and then this new group are, are, is a younger group for the most part. And so I think that uh, that's been exciting so far. We've gone through one cycle. But yeah, each each is different, and and when you if you decide to start a Renshi group, give a little thought in terms of you know do you want a diverse group? Do you want one that's going to be simpler in certain ways that you want to emphasize? And I mean, but yeah, they're they're all different, mm -hmm. and that's okay. one, that's one of the joys. That that's how I will not be raising my hand again. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Debbie, you've raised your hand all day long, and I will listen and be grateful for your input all day long. Yes, so, thank you. so good to see you. Thank you so much. We've got another raised hand here. And I'm so glad uh, for those of you who have questions. This is really helpful. There, there he is. There's the man. How do I see myself? That's a very good question. <laughs> How do you see yourself? Not that yourself? I need to see myself. But I think it's a green screen, which I kind of like. I like it. It's a nice color. I have a question. I don't know if there's an answer, but I struggle between and with the Renchi. Um, it seems like it would be the idea of a conversation. To what extent, and maybe maybe Wayne had had some thoughts about this, and maybe some of the other poets has had. To what degree when one is writing their poem, it's just kind of like taking the line and, and going with it, uh, and then the other the other aspect is, do we have a conversation? Do, do, do you feel like you should respond to, to some aspect of what of the poem that came before, or an, another poem within the cycle? To what extent is it a conversation, um, and to what extent it's just a, just taking a line and, and writing a poem? And I kind of struggle between those two, because mm -hmm. the ideal seems to me would be some kind of conversation in a way, or different perspectives on something shared within the poems, you know, not a direct conversation, but something that's sort of like crossing over. And I wonder if any of the other poets feel that way. It seems like um, Gerard does that. I mean, you you, um, you you not only repeat the first line, but in your poem, you've re you repeated a few other lines in some of the other poems, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah, is there anyone in this Frenchie group who would like to raise a hand and direct... Uh all right, here we go. We've got Patricia coming up. Oops. Oh, where'd Phil go? Phil, I'm bringing you back up. Don't worry. <laughs> go ahead, Joe. I got some. I'm Patricia. Yes, of course. If you've got some yeah. Questions. Well, I'll just answer uh, quickly, and then certainly be interested in in my colleagues' thoughts. Um, there are times when the poem and not just the last line of the poem becomes a prompt. And actually, Phil, I followed you in at least one cycle. And I remember a poem you wrote when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away and I followed you. And so while my poem wasn't a eulogy and it wasn't um, directly uh, tied to that theme, it was definitely inspired by the imagery you use to recognize her. I went back to the Psalms that you had, uh, you know, relied on the vineyard, you know, the, the excellent wife finding the vineyard. And I used that imagery in my poem. So that's an example of my definitely mining uh, more than just the last line as, as fodder for, for the poem. But in my case, I, turned it into talking about land acquisition and, and preserving land um, for, you know, for uh, its own sake. So that's one example there. Other times though, I just, I'm lucky to have anything to, to do <laughs> with the last line. Um, and I let the first thing that comes into my head be where I go. Um, so I, I can't honestly say I often use the poem 
as a prompt and not just the last line. But in that case, I definitely did. So my my two cents there. Yeah, sometimes we can, and sometimes it's we can't. Um, but I remember that poem that you wrote, and that was that was kind of cool. But it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I, th I think to some extent there's kind of conversation built in uh, that we don't even know about consciously. But then when we see some of the poems, and like when I heard that cycle, I I, I saw some echo, I heard some echoes. Mm -hmm. and I'm not even sure we're conscious necessarily, but but they're there because that first line, you know, and then the last line just kind of had already sort of has that energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. We don't have the world enough in time to to go through a cycle sometime and get together and say, oh, here's this is echoing this is like, we don't really have that time, but I, I bet we would find those echoes. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not. Even, oh, I was just going to say maybe not even in terms of topic, but then in some cases uh, in terms of tone and yeah, imagery, well, even. Imagery, yeah. Imagery, so, you know, yeah, so so that's interesting too. You know, yeah. I know after I read any poet, I tend to find aspects of that poem that that poet creeping in at least in my head, whether it ends up on the page or not is another thing. So maybe we maybe we've influenced each other that way too. I think it's got to be in our head. If, if we're taking a last line from from somebody, I think you know we have we 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 have something in there already. There's kind of a seed, you know. Right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of cool. And that makes it really fun. Yeah. I think what's, I just wanted to add, what's interesting about the practice is, um, and, and Debbie commented in the chat here that it, it does read like a conversation. Today's reading does feel like it's interacting and listening, you know, that the poems are a response. And um, I always think about that when, when I'm hearing these, you know, how much is one poet trying to reconcile the poem of the other? The, the one that comes before, trying to reconcile or resolve it or subvert expectations, do something completely, you know, that they feel like it's leading somewhere and now they're trying to subvert, you know, is, is there a reactionary element to it? Um, so it's really interesting to hear you guys talk about, you know, maybe you're not necessarily thinking about it as reactionary, but there's definitely an influence that um, is, you know, unmistakable. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. <laughs> Good. Then I win. I'll shut my mouth for the rest of the time. To, uh, the, the, the critic Harold Bloom talked about the anxiety of influence. Mm. Um, and in his case, it's kind of killing off the, <laughs> the, the parent poem. You know, poet. It's a poet, you're not just a poem. But I don't think it's just that. I think it's what you were saying. It's either it's one or the other, actually, or mm. maybe a little bit of both. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to hear other thoughts. Anybody else, uh, any of our poets or participants who have thoughts on this or questions, um, now's the time for that before we roll into another cycle of reading. Last chance. All right. So, no, wait, wait, as, wait, wait, oh, wait, 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 Wayne, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have jumped in. Uh, no, just the, the idea of responding to the poem before, uh, I kind of re I try to resist that a little bit, and I, I'm not certain why. And I think it's because I think if I'm reacting to someone else's poem, someone else's poem, that what I write will not be something that I'm truly connected and feeling. And I like to to write from from a, a place within. What what I've tried to do, and what it has actually not even try is that I'll get that last line and I'll just ruminate. And that's why it takes me two weeks. It takes me a week to just ruminate on that line. And to it makes a connection with a, a concern or a memory or an event that, that touches me. And then what, what the magic is that it will, I'll approach that event or that memory or that feeling from an entirely different angle than I, I would have done on my own. So that, that influence I'm very grateful for because you can take some really bizarre kinds of lines and you can turn that poem, uh, and that topic in a way that you never, I mean, I just, I just don't, I wouldn't have been able to do, um, spontaneously on, on my own or independently. So, 
buff. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we lost you there, but um, okay, good. So if we're ready to go into the next round of readings, I believe Byron, Byron is, first. is first. So we'll uh, pivot over to Byron. The title of this poem is Not for Nothing. That not is N-A-U-G-H-T. And I have no idea who preceded me in this. Uh, so I apologize for that. For not is a koan. All has meaning. To say such and such has no meaning means something. Intrinsic in all is a what to be understood, and to understand makes teachers and students of us all. One minute teacher, one minute student, the Mobius strip of being alive. From naught all comes, and all goes into naught. It's the lover's naught of life, our ignorance, our knowledge, and somewhere in between our understanding does not go for not. Deborah Sermon is up next. All right, I'm coming for you, Deb. I'm always afraid of the face I make when I'm trying to do computer stuff. So. Yeah, so <laughs> right. All right, it's all you, girl. Okay, this is called They Call It Hope. She does not work for naught, anchoring each thread through the needle, knotting the ends and piercing through fabric layers. She doesn't know she works for posterity now, pulling taut and beginning the line, pull it running calico through the needle, pulling the white line, stitching in the ditch till the quilt is done. She hopes she's done enough to stave off winter blows. Another covering to set aside in cedar chest. Banking for the husband she doesn't have. Hope, they call it. Faded blues and fugitive greens remain when her grandniece pulls the quilt hoard from the cedar chest a life's signature inlaid in each fabric square. And Patricia is next. All right, uh, my poem is called Wildness. Each fabric square of snowfall was washed in the brightest stars, suspended above the roof peak. In the fullness, I heard the owl's call float in the cold air and twigs snap, invisible, in the black woods. The wildness lurking there at the tree line gathered up, tense, dank, with the stank of desperation when water is frozen and food scarce, cold dens soured with thirst and hunger. I wanted it to emerge against the paleness of snow, to step out so I could look on it without fear. I wanted to see it as it saw me. And Wayne follows me in this cycle. Flying Squirrel. Flying Squirrel. I wanted to see it as it saw me from its pantry hideaway. As a momentary shock, as an uninvited guest, an inconvenient mutuality. Cohabitants of a faded grandeur amidst the forest. Simultaneous recognition, suspense suspended, finally face to face with the origin of those strange nocturnal sounds. Uh, next is Phil Terman. Flying squirrels. Strange nocturnal sounds from frozen January 
Time to fill the feeders. Opening the shed door, something, a chipmunk? Darting from wall to wall, spreading out what looked like bat wings, staring back at me with huge bug eyes as if I was the intruder. I slammed the door once, twice, in hopes to scare it back, but no, it's happy with this shelter and the plastic bag of bird seed it ripped open and scattered across the green tarp lining the wooden floor. I considered the diminishing number of cardinals, woodpeckers, morning doves pecking not so patiently at the white ground, waiting for their order to arrive. Opening the door again, slowly stepping back, peeking into the dark cavern, in the far corner, a small bowl of shredded bark and dry leaves balanced on the hemlock board, the tan fury thing beside it, and another of the same kind flung out and I flung back, thinking rabies and, who knows, typhus, rodents swarming in my sleep. Didn't I read once, endangered, a priority species, protected, prefers old growth forests, conifers? They cluster to keep warm. What about the live trap filled it with seed? Haul them one at a time into the woods where they can carry on their love affair and dreams of the future, and we could lure back our multicolored birds, reseal the cracks of the shed. This morning, chucking the trap, locked in, curled up, which one? In the corner of the cage, innocuous, a child's toy, eyes open. Buried it deep in the woods, laid branches over its tiny body, resumed, re returned the trap back to the barn, thought about the other, gliding like a ghost. And Gerard is next to my next up. We can, yeah, we can't hear you right now. Uh, if you have your, should be, yeah, red button next to your video that has audio on it. No? Yeah. If you're able to, if you and Joe are in the same house, if you're able to run over to <laughs> her computer, then we can get you. Yeah, we'll get you just a minute. Yeah, I mean... Patricia. All right, Patricia, in case you didn't get the warning, someone's coming in. <laughs> Very good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Was the question, are we in the same house? <laughs> no, I'm in the barn. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Uh, let me see. This adjusted for me. When atheists pray. Gliding like a ghost, the 747 lifted wheels up to Frank Sinatra's My Way. A moment that wouldn't end, ended. And in the downdraft of those wings, I died a little less that day. The desire for absence, secession, the stoppage of relentless pounding in the ears is an anguish prayer cannot cease, a wish for death. Like a piece of wood that smolders but doesn't burn, abomination has a way of persisting. Bloodshot eyes tacked wide open with toothpicks. I saw brown shirts, swastikas, stiff arm salutes, white power fists, and a congresswoman blame wildfires in California on Jewish lasers in space. God, I can't believe I just wrote that. Like I can't believe I also once loved journeys don't stop believing in a way I once loved and believed in my country, blindly. 
I do still love my country, but now differently, like a fawn wobbling amongst fern, or Ben Franklin flying a kite in a thunderstorm. Something great could potentially, maybe, possibly still happen, or things are always simpler before they change. Or rather, when the self can change, things can be seen simply as they truly are. Moose and squirrel thwart bungling Russian spies, or oligarchs rule the world. So it is. With much fondness, I'll remember that jumbo jet flying away with its would-be oligarch and his bride and settle for dumb luck, chance, fluke, coincidence, fate, odds, the wind, and good timing. It coincided with an atheist's prayer. My dear Sonia or Wayne is up next. Thank you, everyone. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, I'm having. Um, yes, yeah, being our Sonia for another round. I will do it, but I regret Sonia not reading. She's lovely, and I loved for her to, for everyone to hear her voice and her reader poems. But this is for you, Sonia. Nobody's listening. The atheist prayer. Contemplate its journey, floating, rising, directionless. No one is listening, no Brahmin, rogue, or Rakami, no white-bearded being of dubious gender, no Allah, no Yahweh, no or or Osiris, no Zeus or Donar, no pantheon of gods. The sun is indifferent to prayer, casting beams on everyone. The power of the atheist's prayer is lack of motivation to impress some formless entity of rote. Rather, it conveys a wish, an echo of some atavistic gesture, having the same chance of response as pleas made on bended knee, involving sacrifice or ritual dance. Thus, the atheist's prayer is pure. Well, that ends our second cycle. Would you allow me to um, describe the yeah. the, uh, the volunteer activity? If if you want to try Renshi, I'm willing to help organize and manage at least a one cycle go of it for those who who indicate interests. Uh, on the uh, chat, I indicated that you can, um, the contact information where you could send an email to renshipoetry at gmail.com. And what I'm thinking is that um, those who volunteer uh, send you a set of rules and procedures, just how we will do this, just commit to going through one cycle, you know, where everyone will take one turn and when we get to the end of that if you want to continue you can continue if you don't you can bail uh and, and no one will will mind but it'll give you a sense of what it's like and uh you know just a, a feel for the the whole process and the collaboration so again if you are interested if you're in the audience here uh Renshi poetry at gmail.com. Just, you know, indicate uh, today, tomorrow. I'll give you a day or so and I'll get back to, to those who would like to try it and, uh, we'll, we'll give it, uh, a run. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else to. There was one question. Um, you had that Greg Clary posted that I thought was a good, um, you had talked about you go through a cycle and so your obligation when you're joined, not obligation, but your opportunity when you join a Renshi cycle is that when your time comes up, you take the last line, you title it, or you start the line for that poem. 
Um, Greg asks, uh, do you respond to each other's poems? Are they submitted? Or is there final discussion? Um, and I hear that question as, uh, what is the whole of the collaborative project? What, what is expected? What is just optional? Uh, what's the best way? Um, if you got all those. Questions. Were there multiple questions there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of feedback, uh, the, the newest group this year, there has been absolutely silence. Uh, it seems when folks have sent out their poems. And I think that's just a matter of everyone feeling comfortable and getting acquainted with one another. And, and that's not unusual. Uh, typically, and it might be too that individuals are just giving individual feedback rather than group feedback. It's, it's certainly not necessary. Um, I think many times the, the poets, once they receive a submission, will respond in some fashion, uh, with some, some comment. I, you know, I don't, I don't think we're at the point where we've actually provided any, uh, suggestions or criticisms, so to speak. So it's been pretty safe space. It's usually compliments or, uh, some sort of comment. But it's not, it's not required by any means. Um, and, and the commitment for this, this, um, participants, you know, the offering I'm making to the audience here is just for a one cycle. You know, if you, if you give me your name, now, you know, if you, if you contact me through that email list, I'll, I'll contact you with just a description of what the expectations are. You can bail at that point and say, no, I don't think I want to do that. Or, I mean, if you, if you commit, it's just for one cycle. And if uh, there are multiple people who want to continue beyond that, I can help facilitate that. If the group dissolves entirely, that's, that's up to, to the group and the individuals. Did, did I answer everything, Sarah? Yeah, that was great. Okay. Good. Well, I want to thank everyone for, and, and, you know, I hearing everyone read their poems today. I mean, that's one of the, I, th I think, one of the shortcomings of the of how we've structured our Renshi at this point. This is the first time in even the six year group that everyone has read a cycle, and it, uh, you know, I was touched, and I, I mean. That was beautiful. I mean, uh, there's some there's some really good poetry coming out of this, and and I think, wow, without this, there would still be good poetry coming from folks. But you know, it's it, it's nice to be a part of this. I'd like to ask one more question um, before I let everybody go <clears> here, <throat> and and what we're going to do again after we're all done in this format is kick everybody over to. The tables and then at those tables it'll be more like uh, you know everybody on screen and you guys can talk amongst yourselves and it won't be live stream to Facebook or YouTube so any conversations and questions that you have you'll be able to have an interaction that way um, but I did want to ask the whole group um, and again raising your hand and letting us know or chatting in the comments whatever uh, way of responding is good for you but um, has there been anybody who has participated in the Renchi group, written poems, and then went on to submit those poems or publish those poems or use the poems that you generated during that practice for other, uh, other things, other projects, or sharing with other people outside of the Renchi group? I'm just in interested. For those who are looking to kickstart their you know, uh, poetry practice and uh, give themselves another boost, you know, I'd like to hear some stories of ways that the poems that you've written have found new life even beyond the Renji group. Um, so any comments or, yeah, raise your hand here. Trisha. Yeah, you're muted. Hi. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I absolutely do that. Um, I've, I've submitted poems that I've written in response to a Renshi prompt um, a, a, on a number of occasions. And actually one that I wrote in response when I was following Phil um, called Bouldering was accepted by Deep Wild Journal just recently. And, you know, it's a poem that describes a, 
uh, you know, someone who's bouldering and, and, and they're facing off against the boulder and, and, you know, that interaction. So that, that's one example. Um, several of the books or several of the poems that, um, I've written over the couple of years I've been doing this are in sanctity. And, and I think, uh, Wayne mentioned that, uh, fields of, of the, of his heart has a number of poems from, from this same practice. So, you know, it's absolutely part of your overall practice and can certainly give you, um, you know, a canon of poetry to use uh, as submissions or, or for performance or, or whatever else you might have going on. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, great examples. And thank you for speaking to that. Um, other thoughts about how your poems within the Renchi group have found new life outside of the group? Um, all right, I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank all these tremendous poets for gathering in this way, um, helping us stay connected, helping us to hear and appreciate uh, your wonderful work today. I want to thank Wayne for the role that he has played in our literary community uh, to kickstart and motivate and inspire so many poets uh, in, a, in a way that the practice uh, will, you know, feed that inspiration. And uh, sometimes it can be so hard to keep going and you can doubt yourself and you can worry about, you know, if your poetry is ever going, to, if you're ever going to be heard. And the Renchi group is one way that, that everybody does feel heard and inspired to continue. So I so appreciate that um, completely self-initiated, uh, you know, practice that he does and the way that he guides so many people. And he's way too modest and humble to really fully acknowledge the role that he's played in so many poets' lives. But um, but we all know it's true. And uh, for those of you who are interested in supporting the Watershed Journal, and, um, you know, we bring all these events. They're totally free. Um, once we can have events on uh, at our physical location, we want to continue to provide these services and opportunities for people to publish and share work and do all of these things that inspire their storytelling. So if you're looking for a way to support the organization, we've got um, 2021 memberships, and there's still opportunities there. If you'd like to be a member and get really integrated with what we're doing and sponsoring that, there's grassroots uh, sponsorships, which are a little less of a financial obligation, but still another way just to show your support and stay connected. Um, general donations, uh, book donations to the uh, Watershed Books bookstore, and uh, volunteering. If anybody would like to get involved, and either remotely or in person, I should say. There's opportunity to get involved, um, even if you are not comfortable coming into the physical location yet. There's still a way for you to help us out. So all of these opportunities, um, you can visit our website at thewatershedjournal.org or email us at thewatershedjournal at gmail.com to learn more about how you can support everything that we're all doing together. So. Thank you again so much. We're going to send everyone who joined the air meet to the tables. If you'd like to have a seat at a table and keep the conversation going, we encourage you to do that. And for everybody uh, watching on Facebook, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today. I just want to add one more thing. Submissions are going on right now. So if you have stuff that you'd like to send in, it's free and inclusive. Uh, the Watershed Journal at gmail.com, watershedjournal.org slash submit. Uh, and we've got a workshop coming up on March 8th. Uh, which is going to be really great. Uh, we've got a couple of presenters uh, who are doing vastly different, but uh, equally interesting um, and informative sessions. So I hope that you'll check out our website and find out more about that. Um, and uh, yeah, those on air meet stick around. We're going to close the session, join some tables and 